Hey, Robert, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. So, Glad to hear it. In this time of COVID, you're still doing great. Yeah, I mean, I haven't been able to see my uh, grandkids, but yeah. uh, that'll happen in the next week. Let me introduce us. This is Glenn Lowry at The Glenn Show at uh, bloghits.tv. Uh, and I am with Robert Cherry. Robert is professor of economics emeritus, uh, Brooklyn College, and a prolific writer on uh, social policy issues, inequality issues, uh, things of that kind, uh, published all over the place. Uh, and uh, we're going to be talking today about uh, what he's been doing of late on the issue of uh, increase in homicide in American cities uh, 2020 over 2019. But I assume we'll get beyond that. So how's it, how's it going, uh, Robert? Are, are uh, you keeping pretty well during this time of pandemic and whatnot? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm uh, somewhat blessed. Uh, I live in a in a nice neighborhood where I could walk around, not congested. And, uh, you know, my wife and I are retired, so we don't have to deal with much other than uh, going to the supermarket and getting takeout. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're retired, but you're, you're still pretty active, man. I see your pieces all over the place. Well, I got time. I can't see my grandkids. I can't do any traveling. Uh, you know, besides walking with a couple of friends during the week, I got a lot of time and, uh, and I have a lot of interest in and concern about, you know, what is needed to move black neighborhoods and vulnerable black youth forward. So I, I think, as you know, I, I have a manuscript that speaks to these things and uh, I pull stuff out and expand stuff uh, because I think, you know, I have constructive things to say. I do indeed agree that you have constructive things to say. I mean, people should know that uh, Robert is a, a frequent uh, guest here on The Glenn Show a half dozen times or more in years past. Uh, precisely because he is thinking uh, in a uh, uh, you know data-based uh, way, but in a in a very uh, thoughtful way about what will work on the ground to try to improve life chances for disadvantaged African Americans and others. Um, but you're especially concerned about homicide these days. Yes, because uh, you know to turn around black neighborhoods you got to get rid of the high crime rate. You're not going to get working class, stable working class, black and others to move into those neighborhoods, to stay in those neighborhoods, unless the crime rates are contained and the gun violence is contained. Uh, I consistently make a point about Ta-Nehisi Coates. You know, he wrote about Baltimore. He grew up in Baltimore in the the 1980s to a black nationalist family. They moved out of Baltimore to the suburbs because of the crime rate. Now he was pissed off because his friends and this and that, but they just didn't want to raise their kids any longer in the neighborhoods uh, that had this high crime rate, which he talked about a lot in his book, uh, The Beautiful Struggle. So, you know, I'm, okay. I'm looking at it from the standpoint of what's going to help turn neighborhoods around so that they are not pockets of deep poverty and uh, the resulting uh, dynamics that are very counterproductive. Let me let me just uh, hold you up for a minute because you're going to talk about what needs to be done about that. But I just want to underscore the fact that whereas... Um, a conventional narrative would be, you know, uh, poverty causes crime. Communities are poor. People don't have jobs. They don't have money. Of course, you're going to see crime. You're going to see gangs. You're going to see drugs. You're making an argument in the opposite direction. Crime causes poverty in the sense that vitality of neighborhoods is sapped or undermined. 
because well, it's interactive, you know, with feeds. Well, that's that's what I want to that's what forth. I want to say. And, and, and I want to be clear that to the extent that it's interactive, then the question becomes, you know, what do you propose to do? And at what juncture of the interaction do you want to intervene? And I gather you want to intervene in ways that are uh, law enforcement oriented or uh, well, something like that. Well, it's a dual. On the one hand, you do need law enforcement. And I think there's been an incredible understatement of the advances made in many cities where police have taken seriously community relations. Now, they haven't always been successful, but I mean, I interviewed uh, a recently retired uh, chief commander in Philadelphia. He was, uh, in charge of 21 precincts. Uh, you know, they had plans where they would come to street corners with job fairs. They would bring employers, this is the police, they would bring employers to those corners to help get those who want, get them jobs. This is recent? It was reasonably successful. This is recent in Philadelphia? This is two years ago, a year or two ago, uh, he did that. We all know about John Ponder in Las Vegas and what he does with ex-offenders. Tell us about it. Tell oh. us, not everybody knows. Well, why don't you tell him? No, uh, I want you to tell him. Well, he's somebody who uh, had been incarcerated for uh, violent felonies and he turned his life around in prison. Uh, much of it was a religious awakening uh, and he went back to Las Vegas and has developed an extensive network of helping ex-offenders with the police. The police uh, essentially engage in mentoring of individuals from uh, who had been in prison and, you know, at least up through 2019. I mean, Las Vegas has a lot of construction, you know, has a has the kind of jobs that you can fit in people who have who want to work and may not have uh, the best formal skills. So he's been effective there. You can look in Pittsburgh. You have some similar things with the police. Uh, you know, Seattle, uh, people talk about Camden in New Jersey. Uh, so, you know, this idea that the police are the enemy, uh, that they, uh, you know, it takes them very little for them to react violently to blacks they engage on in the street is, uh, is a false narrative in the aggregate. Of course, there were examples, but in the aggregate, it's a false narrative. But as I mentioned, I'm, I'm really focused on employment, you know, in terms of that's what's going to turn around a lot of black youth is get them off the street and get them not being on the street. Uh, you know, I think one of the most uh, damaging uh, I don't know, I don't want to overstate it, but a damaging aspect of dynamics is this four-year college for all. Okay, okay. Robert, I'm going to stop you because there's okay. a lot of information on the table. Okay. I would just put a little bit of organization on the thing. Okay, so uh, crime is inhibiting community development. Yes. So remedies for crime will include creative ways of engaging police with communities as is exemplified across the board in many cities, including what you were saying about John Ponder in Las Vegas. So the issue about how to respond to crime involves a law enforcement piece and it also involves an employment piece. Yes, and as I was beginning to say, 20% uh, of black men, 18 to 24, are neither in school nor in work. And I think part of that is this four-year college for all. What's the number for white men, excuse me for asking? Uh, just under 10%. So, so a little twice than half. Well, yeah, okay, go ahead. 
uh, there's this view that everyone should go into the college system, the academic college system, first at the community colleges with the goal of a four year degree. There are more than a quarter, 27% of black men, 25 to 29, 27% have some college, but no degree. That is, they have dropped out. Now, certainly some of them could have dropped out because they got a decent job, but a lot of them drop out and they're on the street corner. And in, and a number of cities, and New Orleans is one of them, have tried to rectify that by having the high schools prepare people in an occupational way where they can go on and take certificates, what are called stackable certificates. So you get a short-term certificate, which has the advantage of being successful. I mean, these are kids who have had nothing but failure in the school system. And getting a certificate is an accomplishment. And what's known as stackable certificates, you get one, gets you an entry-level job, then you get another certificate and you get another. Often these certificates can be built towards associate degrees at two years colleges. So now what are they learning uh, in these certificates? They're getting uh, useful skills about- Well, they're getting uh, useful skills. Some of it in the, in the food service industries, in uh, the leisure travel industries, uh, in some uh, technical, you know, low tech. Uh, so these certificates are smaller step and more uh, applicable to practical use uh, skill certifications that fall short of a educational college degree, but that are achievable for this cohort of low skilled uh, men and build on one another so as to create a foundation for their work life. Yes, I don't, you know, I don't want to build a super rosy picture here, but it's a direction that can be very, can be successful. And for me, as I said, one of the key things is it allows them to be successful, uh, often for the first time in their life in an academic, you know, in a quasi academic training sector. How are you relating this to crime? What? How are you relating this? Because they're not on the street. They have a different social network. I mean, one of the things about work and, and school is that you build a different social network than you have if you're disconnected and you're on the street. And so, I mean, that's why teen employment used to be an extremely important first step for a lot of youth. They they just get a different social network. They get mentoring from effective people. Uh, Now we can't go back to massive teen employment like we used to, we should go, we should try more of it. But this is is the equivalent of what a generation ago and two generations ago, teen employment did. Okay. Now, one thing I'm noticing about this is it's a focus on the supply side. I mean, you're looking at the labor market and you're saying enhance the skills of people. You're, you're not talking so much about employers or about uh, government employment as a last resort. You're talking about, um, and, and you're relating it to crime. I mean, you're, 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 I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you're, you know, they have alternative uses of their time and they can be more or less productive and whatnot. Um, and I'm just wondering if you have any uh, misgivings about, you know, kind of, this is not structure, this is uh, behavior, this is like almost culture, you're, you're com- coming close to blaming the victim. Uh, and you're not talking about policing at all. You, you talk about police in terms of a cooperative spirit, uh, you know, almost like midnight basketball or something but uh, not talking about police in terms of the culture, police violence, 
uh, about uh, racism and stereotypes and policing and things like that. So I have to say this, uh, Bob, I mean, you know, just to make sure we cover both sides of the of the aisle here. What do you have to say to that? Well, look, there's no question that the criminal justice reform has been counterproductive to the extent it's gone. That is certainly there should have been some bail reform. Certainly there should be some diversion from prison uh, to other kinds of programs for people. Uh, but I think in, in the attempt to reduce incarceration, it has just gone too far. Even in this, uh, you know, there was an article in the New York Times uh, just this week in which even Mayor de Blasio says that maybe it went too far in New York, the bail reform and the decriminalizing of uh, many things. Uh, the person I mentioned in Philadelphia, this former commander, he says in Philadelphia now, if you get if you're caught with uh, an illegal gun, it's a misdemeanor the first time. And he says even the second time, it's often pleaded down to a misdemeanor. Now it's true if you were raw, you know, if you're doing something violent with a gun. Uh, there may be a little bit more, but absent any overt uh, criminality, uh, you're, it's a misdemeanor. So, you know, that sends a certain kind of signal. And what he, what he mentioned is one of the reasons he thinks that people don't help the police is if they see people that are out on the street the next day, you know, with no bail, misdemeanor, what's the upside of them informing on somebody? So, uh, you know, it's a vicious cycle kind of thing that occurs. So I, I'm not at all saying that there has, that it's simply getting jobs for people in a more effective way and the police can help and, uh, Vocational training can help, but you have to pull back on the excessive of uh, reforms, many of which were needed, but not to the ex extent they have been. Uh, the example I give in the book I'm writing is the difference between New York and New Jersey. Both had, had bail reform, but in Jersey, there was still substantial discretion to the judge. In New York, it took away totally this, the discretion of the judge on whether or not to do bail. Uh, and that's where there was a real problem. Uh, it's been pretty effective in Jersey, but not in New York. Let me underscore something here, uh, Robert. So a person is arrested for a crime and uh, prior to them being uh, convicted in a court of law, they may or may not be held in custody pending their trial. Bail is something that allows the person to be out before the trial actually takes place. So the person on bail has not been convicted of anything. On the other hand, we know that amongst the set of people who are going to be subject to the possibility of being tried for a crime, who have been arrested by the police, there are people who, if at liberty, will commit more crimes. Right. The question, that, like, the question here the, is whether or not to deprive them of that liberty. Now, by having a more strict bail regime, we basically put a financial penalty in front of them, which they can't meet. So they're being held in prison or jail pending a trial for an offense for which they have not yet been convicted. Many people think that's unjust. And the racial disparity in the population subject to this is a part of why they think so. You are disagreeing, if I get you correctly, with those people and saying the effect of holding them prior to trial was beneficial in terms of the reduction of crime and violence in the community 
And what you're calling reform has got a terrible cost, which Robert Cherry reckons is too much to be willing to pay for whatever benefit you think you're getting from it. Well, but as I said, that's where the discretion of the judge comes in. So let's say someone is arrested for a burglary of $300. Well, if this is the first burglary that that person was involved in, you know, maybe they, sh you know, they shouldn't have to have bail necessarily. But if it's the second or third or the fifth time that they have been, that's where the discretion of the judge comes in. And sure, you can have, you know, lock them up type judges who no one will get bail. But I don't think we live in that environment anymore. I think we're in an environment where this kind of discretion of judges can be pretty effective at distinguishing between the people who clearly should have no bail and those who, you know, they're repeat offenders and uh, they should have uh, bail. And it's worked in Jersey. In other words, it's been a, two years in Jersey. Okay. And no one's saying that, oh, these judges are locking everyone up and so on. Well, I mean, we started out with you. I uh, just want to backtrack a little bit with you talking about how um, the crime problem uh, up 2020 over 2019, violent crime, homicide in particular, a lot of cities around the country was a serious problem because it impeded economic activity and uh, so forth, and employment. And that was a kind of vicious circle. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what's actually going on. And you, you've been looking at the numbers. I mean, I saw one of your pieces where you had a table where you had like the top cities in terms of the proportionate increase in homicides 2020 over 2019. Right. Uh, there were a lot of big cities in there. A lot of cities had very substantial increases. What's going on? What are the numbers saying? And, and you know, uh, why well, do you I was think able, that that's happening? I was able to cobble together the top, the largest 50 cities and 25 of the next 29. The homicide, the homicides in 2020 versus 2019. Overall, in those 75 cities, the increase was about 34%. Uh, wait, 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 he's striking. Homicide in the top 75 cities in America is up 35% over one year period of time. Yes, yes. Um, and I think shootings are up even more. Uh, so for is there any historical precedent for that one year over next, at least in the last hundred years? Well, I don't know, but there's, it certainly hasn't been in the last 20. I don't know, in the 80s, you know, there okay. might have been uh, something. But now you have uh, homicides in many cities are at levels that are, weren't reached till more, were reached 20 years, 25 years ago. Uh, People should understand there was a huge increase in uh, violent crime in America going up through the early 90s, but it uh, peaked and then tailed off sharply over the last 25, 30 years. But it looks like we're we're seeing another resurgence yes. comparable to what it is that we saw at the height of violence in American cities in the 1990s. Not quite. And, I, and if you just look at homicides of black men, even before this year, the, I mean, I don't have numbers for this year, but I looked at numbers from 2005 to 2019. In 2005 and six, black men, uh, black homicides, uh, homicides of black men were about 10 to 15% higher than the homicides of white men it is now 60% higher. That is, for every 10 white men who are victims of homicides, there are 16 black men who are victims. 
Mind you now, there got to be at least five times as many white men as black men in the population. You got that right. So it, <laughs> it's an inordinate disparity. Uh, and this is the so-called black on black crime. These are not white vigilantes and white supremacists going into black neighborhoods and killing people. Uh, so, you know, you have already before this year, a kind of increases in gun violence in black neighborhoods. And I would expect it's even worse this year where those increases are overwhelmingly in, of black Americans. Let's give people America. some idea about how many people we're talking about. Homicides in America in a year, like 15,000, 17,000, something like that. Yeah, I mean, it. it's, uh, you're actually right in there. 15 to uh, 17. Black, so, uh, black, hot, black men killed in a year, it was order of magnitude 8,000, something like that. Uh, in the 7,000, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's all blacks that are killed. Uh, is about seven to eight thousand before this year. Okay. So, you know the now is. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm. People, please don't get mad at me for saying this, but I want you to compare that to the number of unarmed black men who were shot and killed by police officers, of which you could probably measure on the digits 14. of uh, your hands year, and your feet. Last year it was actually thirteen. The year before it was fourteen. Again, I'm not grinding an axe. Please don't get mad at me out there. But I just want you to take on board what we're talking about here, the magnitude of the threat to the integrity of the black body, the, 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 the risk of actually getting killed and losing your life if you're black. It's orders and orders and orders of magnitude higher from the phenomenon of crime, civil society within African-American communities than it is from police violence. That should have a political implication, it seems to me. Well, the problem is there's no easy solution for the so-called black on black crime. And there's a fear that you were making these young black men uh, blaming, you're blaming the victims. Here you have black men who have who are growing up in neighborhoods where you have intergenerational poverty. Uh, I mean, I have I have numbers. There are eleven cities that stand out in terms of the homicide rates. They're all cities which have at least thirty six percent of the population is black, and it's just. Uh, it's just amazing the kinds of differences. These are neighborhoods, these eight, these cities have three times the number of children living in high poverty. They have, you know, double the disconnected rate, double those living uh, in extreme poverty. Uh, you know, there are, one measure after another, when you look at those cities, and we know what they are, they're Baltimore, Detroit, uh, Cleveland. Uh, yeah, St. Louis. St. St. Louis is just unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, and you, they're really hurting those cities. And, um, you know, something has to be done. And this idea that, well, it's much easier to focus on the excesses of police, right? Because they're people who we have some control over and we can change their behavior, get them fired, get them this and that. Uh, but again, we're talking about, and, and it's true with police, there's more than just, you know, how many they kill you know, how many do they throw up against the wall? How many do they, you know, sure. do other things to besides killing them? Yeah. So there's certainly, we don't want to totally understate the concern about police behavior. 
but as I said before, it's not it's not done in a balanced way. That you know, there are good things they do, and and the black community wants more policing. Uh, so. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a that's a fact that deserves to be underscored. If you ask people on the ground in black communities what they want, the, it, it's not an ideological, theoretical argument about white supremacy and systemic racism. It's that my car got jacked the other day. It's that I'm afraid that somebody's coming in through my window in my bedroom. It's that, you know, I heard gunshots the other night. It's that my kid got rousted and mugged and et cetera. That's right. what they right. that's how they answer those questions. I, I just want to say a couple of things. One of them is you say the uh, number of children and families in poverty and whatnot in the cities where you see the high black uh, uh, crime victimization rates. A lot of people would say, of course, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Poverty causes crime. Of course, if you don't do something about joblessness and poverty, uh, you, you're going to have these problems. The uh, uh, police. But it's not the whole thing. It's not in the other whole words, thing. In other words, I went across. I did uh, some statistical work on these 75 cities and poverty and employment does show up to be important predictors. But even after you take that into account, the share of black, of the black population, the share of the population of the city that's black is still a strong predictor of crime. So there's, there's stuff going on more than poverty. The other thing about poverty is there are a number of cities that are high poverty, but low homicide rates. There are almost all cities that have a very large Latino population. So that, you know, Latino poverty doesn't lead to the same dynamics that black poverty does. And, you know, there's a reason for that. What uh, is it, Bob? That's a very important uh, thing to say. What is the reason? Well, I, I think one of the arguments is that, um, well, I'll be, one of the, one of the, I was going to say, you know, blacks have machetes and, and, excuse me, blacks have guns and yeah. Latinos have machetes and you really can't do drive-bys with machetes. Uh, but I think it's it's this intergenerational poverty that in the black community, it's not simply that people that there are poor young men, but their fathers and mothers were poor and their grandparents were poor. Whereas in the Latino community, you know, even if they're second generation, they're not they're not wedded to this uh, victimization. Uh, and hopelessness that many young black people uh, become engendered with. That they, you know, they go out and work, they have networks for jobs, so that uh, there's still a hopefulness. Now, what happens if by the third generation they're still poor? Yeah, who knows? There may be something like the black phenomena. But, you know, they they have a much more hopeful situation. They have much more of a of an employment network than young black people have. So uh, they don't get caught up in the same street corner dynamics and hopelessness that blacks have. And they also don't have the victimization. One of the things I, I pointed out in the article that you read is, you know, these these demonstrations over the summer, the late spring and over the summer, that went on forever. I mean, how is that going to impact on a young black kid who, you know, is somewhat separated from employment, from school and even their family? You know, they got a lot of anger. And what are these demonstrations and the notions of white supremacy? What does that do to those kids? Uh, you don't have that in the Latino community. They don't talk about white supremacy. Uh, and they don't talk about a, the kind of victimization. You know, maybe in their home country, there was that. So I think there's, there's a just different cultural dynamics 
among poor Latinos than there is among poor Blacks? Uh, that's a very controversial statement, Robert. It, it's one that I agree with wholeheartedly, but it's, it's such a difficult matter. Um, here's what I've been thinking lately. Um, I did read your piece and I, I learned from it. Um, and, and the psychological dimension, this dimension of how you interpret the opportunities that are at hand, you know, I mean, the, this identity dimension to the problem, a kind of self-imposed limitations, uh, a kind of, uh, you know, ta Coates preaches the same kind of thing, doesn't he? And his outlook that the white, the American dream is a hoax. It's a, it's an empty uh, shell, you know, uh, Nicole Hannah Jones preaches this too, doesn't she? And the, uh, I'm sorry if I can continue in this vein, I'll become political and I don't want to, I don't want to be political. I want to talk about these communities and these people, but, what I've been saying lately is uh, if we don't focus on the developmental imperative of enhancing the capacities of disadvantaged people of color, or if I can get away from that trendy uh, language, get poor black people in the ghettos of this country, if we don't concentrate on developing their capacities to work, to be productive citizens, to uh, comport themselves in a way that are not a threat to their neighbors, uh, to fulfill their human potential, to have the kind of, you're not for college degrees, but cognitive function beyond a basic level is surely a desirable thing, to acquire skills, to be settled in their lives, to stabilize their home environment, provide a stable environment for their children to raise, be raised in. If we don't focus on the developmental imperative, we're never going to solve the racial inequality problem. It's not a problem of something abstract called white supremacy or systemic racism. It's a problem etched in the lives of many hundreds of thousands of people of a failure to develop their human potential. Uh, we have to be realistic about the fact that that potential has not been developed, uh, that, that people are failing to realize their full uh, human possibilities. Uh, and we have to be aggressive at addressing ourselves directly to the institutions, uh, the sites, the social locations where that development takes place. Okay, I've spoken long enough in that vein. That sounds at least vaguely consonant with your own view, Robert. Yes, it is. And, and one of the things that is very troubling is that to get at understanding though, how to change dynamics uh, is off limits in particular the black family formation and its impact, uh, the school system in ways uh, that we can learn from charter schools and why they're consistently, almost universally have provided a, an environment in which success can take place compared to the public schools, that to talk about these things is pretty much off limits in uh, now, be, the Be more explicit about what you're talking about. What things can't be talked about? How do charter schools deal with them more effectively than public schools? Well, I think that it's the issue of the family. Uh, Charter schools have found a way to engage the family, to get them to be the kinds of parents that they ideally want to be. Not that they found a way to locate the parents who already are what they no, want to be I and they've cherry picked them? No, no, they haven't Okay, in a sense. But I give the example of people deciding they want to do exercise to improve their health. They're well-meaning, but often unless they have a coach, unless they go to a gym where somebody is coaching them, yeah. don't fulfill their goal. This gets in the way, that gets in the way. Yeah. And I think that's true about a lot of these single parents, particularly single mothers, is they, they genuinely have 
constructive ideals for their kids' education and how that can be, how they can help. But they got complicated lives. They don't, you know, they need a coach. They need somebody who prods them. And that's what the charter schools do. So maybe they take parents who have a little bit more of an inclination to want that. Sure. They do it. It isn't like they just have parents who will, you know, who are tiger moms. Yeah. They, they have parents who have aspirations and the charters help them fulfill those aspirations. And the problem is the public schools can't do that because that's paternalism. That's, that's telling parents, this is what you should do. This is what, and you know, how dare the government tell you know, it's, it's the school's responsibility to do what they do and not get into our lives. So, I mean, I think that is a real difference. Let me just make an observation. And I wonder how you, I, I want you to go on. I, I, I really do okay. because uh, what to do about the development problem is the issue. But I just wanted to pause for a historical moment because I know in, in your intellectual ambition, you have written about a lot of different things, you know, about social life amongst immigrant groups going back to the early part of the 20th century and all like that. (laughs) It wasn't always so, was it, that public institutions felt restrained from being able to tell people how to live and show them how to live. It wasn't like that in the tenements on the Lower East Side and all of that coming up in New York City in the 1930s and the 1940s. Well, there was the Americanization process. Well, yeah. John Dewey was about. which, Which was paternalistic. Yeah, and it had some bad aspects to it. Oh, okay, okay, okay. You know, so uh, you know what uh, you know white what white elite want is not necessarily always fully what should be done. But I'm simply saying charter schools have found a way to be effective in this regard. So it's not simply that they so-called cherry pick. The parents, obviously, they get parents who are more receptive to something like this. Bob, I just want to say, I'm saying work hard, keep your nose clean, take care of your kids, get your homework done, value excellence, keep your nose to the grindstone. Those are not white. That's not anything white coming over anybody. That's just the formula for being successful in America. Which people formula? Think. Many people, most of them have in, are intellectuals with the initials behind their name, would say it's an imposition of white society on on blacks. But in fact, it's the recipe for getting out of the fix that they're in. It certainly works for Nigerian immigrants and uh, many others. But I also think that you have they have to get into the family earlier that it ends up, while you don't have as much teen employment as you had a decade or two ago, you still have a large share of black women having their first child before they're 25. And and many of them have low levels of education. And they don't come from, you know, a two parent family. So what do you want to do besides coach them? You know, I mean, one of the things you were saying with respect to the kids and education as the charter schools they could coach. What what do you want to send nurses home from the with the from the hospital with the baby? Do you want right, universal they have these pre-K visiting nursing programs that go up to three years old, where they are incredibly effective at helping these young women to do what's not only good for their kids, but indirectly for themselves. And, uh, you know, Maya de Blasio before this pandemic was going to broadly expand visiting nursing programs that are primarily done now by a lot of nonprofits. Uh, But those are the things that are going to be helpful where you get into the family. It isn't it's uh, pre-K, universal pre-K is the exact opposite. It says we can be substitutes for the family. 
we can take care of this educational okay. that and so yeah not bad. G- give us the kid give us a kid for six hours a day we'll fix it that's right that and we won't get into the family yeah so i mean again there's a downside there are risks there's paternalism but that's the kind of effective programming that will and you know these mothers by and large, they are uh, very positive. They're getting services. They're getting information. They're getting networks where you're told if you have this problem, you go to this group, you go here. They, they aren't saying, how dare you come into my house? How dare you? You know, it is being effective. And uh, there should be more of it uh that can be done and you know they could be done for five and six and seven year olds there are equivalent kinds of programs in baltimore there's something called the thread program that does tutoring and but again comes into the house and uh engages the parent or parents in the process so um and You know, I think fatherhood programs and uh, interpersonal programs can also be effective in creating a a healthier and more stable environment for kids. What would you do about uh, reentry of uh, previously incarcerated uh, people uh, and and supporting that, reconnecting them with their uh, kids, uh, getting them into some kind of skill certification uh, environment. I mean, that's kind of the thing that- uh, Well, John there are Ponder... programs that do that. Uh, yeah. And, you know, they have fatherhood program. Fatherhood programs are some of the job development programs because it's an issue. Uh, but again, in New York City, anyone who has been incarcerated and either has been able to get a GED or is close to a G- GED, Every one of those people are put into an academic program in the community college with the goal of a four-year degree. Now, it, those programs have like a 25% success rate just finishing the two-year degree. And most of those two-year degrees are the liberal arts degree, which is only good for transfer. So they're not getting a skill because the liberal arts degree is much more difficult than a lot of the occupational programs in the community college. You know, you need you need certain math skills and other skills for many of the occupational programs. Uh, so, uh, so I think you know. Again, it's it's going back to what Obama. I mean, after all, Obama had these Brothers Keepers initiatives, which was essentially directing more kids into an option of an occupational track than uh, an academic one. So, uh, but again, I think that you have to get into the family in a constructive way with young kids. Um, One of the most striking outcomes of the statistical testing of homicides that I did was that it, it ended up that female single parent households in no way were linked to homicides. You know, it wasn't that cities that had more children living in in female single parent households had higher homicide rates. But what was linked was children living in male single headed households. It ends up that across these 75 cities, 22% of children in single parent households were in households where the single parent was the father. I would have never guessed it was now, that why high. this? That seems like a very large Well, number. but why is it? Yes, I was surprised. But I think it, and I'm trying to find out more because I just couldn't believe this result. But, it, but in for 2019 and 2020, this variable shows up to be statistically significant at the 5% level. And it's a negative. You know, it's the not, higher the proportion of single parent 
uh, fathers, the lower the level of uh, the increase in children living with single, homicide. Yes, it decreases. And my my view, and I want to talk to people. I'd love to talk to someone who's with child services to find out what you know. What's the dynamics that leads to these fathers living with fathers? I think it's you know the somewhat chaotic dynamics that happens. After all, these are not these are not kids that are coming from a married couple where there's a divorce and there's one kid goes here and one kid goes there. Because, you know, in the black community, this is coming from never married women. So why are these never married women giving up their kid to go with the father who was not even their husband? There had, you know, there has to be some adverse dynamics that lead to that happening. And, you know, it's those kids who are most at risk. They're separated from their mother. You know, they may be with their father because of negative reasons. And the father may be uh, also in fragile situations and they don't know what parenting they're doing. You know, I'm a little bit troubled, Bob. I'm a little bit troubled by the fact that you're using cross city variation in the proportion of kids living with father only households instead of observing directly households where a father may or may not be the single parent and looking at outcomes across those micro observations. I agree with you. Yeah. That's why I want to talk to people who do child services. Uh, I mean, I talk to a few people who do some family stuff, but they were just shocked. It was 22%. And they had no idea. I couldn't find, I did a quick survey of the literature. I couldn't find any research on what goes on in these father uh, headed households. So I agree with you that I really shouldn't make any strong judgments or sub, you know, suggestions. Did you but look I'm, at, uh, I'm amongst, just saying, did you look amongst whites at what fraction of kids with a single parent or with the dad heading the household? Well, no, it, this is the aggregate for cities, yeah. the 22. So it's white and and black. Okay, uh, okay. But, but again, these are cities, it's gonna be uh, a blacker, uh, it's gonna be a blacker sample than the overall population. Yes, and- Slightly uh, so. But it, but again, it, you know, if I had found that it was female headed households, no problem. You know, we, we have a whole script that describes how children raised in these single headed households, single parent households yeah. have a range of risks in their lives. Um, so anyway. Well, let me just uh, say, I, I, the lesson know, that, I'm taking from this is that the household dynamic is a lot more complicated than simply whether or not there are two parents present. Uh, that's right. Th there's a lot that's going on there, including what might be the genesis of the single parentedness in the first place. And indeed, if the father is the single parent heading the household because the mother has abandoned the kid, that that might suggest a very different genesis of that child's development. Oh no! Look, you have, you know, because of of the a large degree of what's called multi-partner fertility, yeah. where women and men have sequential children, you're going to have lots of situations where women are now in a second relationship. Yeah. And again, I'm just projecting, but they can be with a guy who, you know, doesn't really doesn't like the, the kid, kid from the first, yeah. doesn't accept the other kid. Yeah. And what happens to that other kid? You know, so so again, I'm conjecturing, and that's why I want to talk to someone who who's involved with these kind of families and can give some insight into why I'm getting the statistical outcome that I'm getting. I mean, it it, it can't be spurious. You know, it's 75 cities. It's two different years. And it just, and it's not sensitive to the other variables that are in the model. 
It just yeah. stays there, you know, with a key score of 2.42 or 2.22. <laughs> Let, let me take you there. back. Let me take you back <laughs> to the beginning of this conversation. A thirty-five percent increase in America's top seventy-five cities yes. in, in homicide, two thousand twenty over twenty nineteen. Why? Why did that happen? Well, as I said, you know, I think the deepening of poverty. It's no question that that had an impact. I, in fact, did a simple regression where I looked at the change of, in each one of the 75 cities, the change in the uh, homicide rate, and I regressed it against the share of, the black share of those cities and the poverty rate of those cities. It ended up, the poverty rate was strongly statistically significant, not the black share. So, and, in the other regressions I did, it's quite clear that for 2020, poverty became a much more important variable in determining homicide dynamics. But it's not the only story. And as I mentioned, you know, I think criminal justice reform, police pullback in cities, because if you look at the timing of the increase in cities, it was much more after May starting in May, after the uh, George Floyd dynamics began. And I, in my article, I make a point of uh, referencing LeBron James. So LeBron James was appalled when he saw the shooting of Jacob, uh, what was Blake. his last name? Jacob Blake. 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 You know, you see that video, Jacob Blake, you see that video in front of his kids, he shot. And so what James says, and I want to get the quote right, he says, um, and I know people get tired of hearing me say it, but we are scared as black people in America, black men, black women, black kids, we are terrified. But then he goes on to give an explanation about the police. He says, you have no idea how the cop that they left the house. You don't know if he woke up on this side of the bed. You don't know if he woke up on the wrong side of the bed. You don't know if he had an argument at home with his significant other. You don't know if one of his kids said something to him and he left the house steaming. So that's what he projects onto cops. What I say, and I said this 20 minutes ago, you know, what about these black kids who are on the street? They're disconnected from school, from family, from religion. What do you think that they're going to, what side of the bed are they going to be waking up if they see these demonstrations every day talking about how the police are out to get you? They listen to commentators saying, this is a white supremacist society. Yeah. They're going to wake up on the wrong side of the bed every day, and it's going to take very little to trigger them. Yeah. Uh, that's what Tanahisi Coates said. His growing up in Baltimore, it took almost, you know, it took nothing almost for there to be a trigger where there would be gun violence. So I think that, that that's why it spread to cities beyond the ones that had the viral episodes. The ones that had the viral episodes had much higher. The homicide rate in Louisville doubled in the year. Yeah. It went up in Milwaukee by 95%. Louisville is in, Breonna uh, Taylor. Louisville is Breonna Taylor. Yeah. Milwaukee is- It went near, up can, in what is Milwaukee? Minneapolis is that, with George Blake. Floyd. George Floyd, yeah. That's Blake. It went up by 72% in Milwaukee, where you had uh, George Floyd. So it certainly went up in the cities where there was the most anger engendered by the perception, at least, if not the reality, of the police actions. Uh, but I think it went up broadly around the country because these demonstrations were everywhere. You know, Hold they on, let were, me, I, I just want to draw were, this out. I want to draw this out a little bit. So the first point you're making is 
An incident is the product of the interaction between two parties, the cop and the suspect. Both of them have got psychological dynamics going on. And so if the outcome is a negative, it well might have to do with the interaction between negativity on both sides of that thing. Cop might have got out of the wrong side of the bit. Kid might have a chip on his shoulder. So that's point one. Point number two is you're saying national events, viral events that then get promoted through the media and through activist choices about what it is that they're going to promote and demonstrate against and whatnot affect the psychology of individuals in such a way that these interactions that they have with police officers turn out to be more likely to go bad. Now, I'm not talking about police officers. These are interactions they have with uh, other people in the oh, community. I see that could lead if to violence. It looks the wrong way at them. I see. If someone dis, you know, if they somebody said something and you dissed me. Thanks for the correction. You, know, you are, you know, you're on a hair trigger because of this dynamics. Now, it's true okay. there was some killing of police. There was some, you know, looting and rioting that went on because of this anger. But I think the everyday anger is just how they deal with their everyday interactions with other people. And you're saying and, that was exacerbated uh, by by the national furor over the killing of George Floyd? Not simply national furor, but in their own cities, there were demonstrations nightly for weeks on end. It started with George Floyd. Then you had Breonna Taylor. Then you had Jacob Blake. You had a whole series that extend these demonstrations literally for a month on end, almost nightly. So everybody's so on it. Edge. Saturated. And then if two guys get into a beef in a bar or something like that, it's more likely to end up in gunplay. Again, I'm just trying to understand what you're saying. Yes. You know, or on the street, uh, you, you know, I heard you diss my girlfriend. Yeah. And you get in a car and yeah. you find them and you shoot them. Yeah. You know, it. it these, this gun violence is not over drug territory. I mean, that's something that maybe was 20, 30 years ago. These things are over personal beefs. And uh, it's, it's unfortunate. But if you got a lot of angry people who have guns, you're going to have this kind of dynamics. You know, as I said, that's what Tony E.C. Coates talked about growing up in Baltimore in the 1980s, you know, he gave a number of examples of this kind of dynamics where almost nothing would lead to gun violence. All right. Well, Depressing, Rob, eh? what else you want to say, man? I've, I've heard you uh, and I think we've learned from you on uh, the general question uh, I think the takeaway I'm most focused on here is we got to get inside the family. That's a very muscular statement about public policy, getting inside the family. That's a heavy lift. Um, I think the emphasis on vocational training uh, for young men, the importance of uh, doing something about idleness uh, and how that contributes to uh, susceptibility to And failure, doing something not only about idleness, but failure. It is a very so, important emphasis, giving them a sense of success and of value. I, I think your point about the, the poisoning of the environment by a kind of mindlessness and protest that uh, uh, doesn't uh, actually uh, reinforce the sense of what it is that can really be done. And, and your emphasis on uh, early intervention in family with uh, nurse visitation and whatnot. I mean, these are all... When people say, what's the solution? I'm going to say, talk to Robert Cherry. And uh, hopefully when I get a publisher for this book, you can say, read this book. <laughs> Publishers, did you all hear that? His book is, his proposal at the very least is worth reading. <laughs> okay, Bob. So thanks a lot uh, for giving us some time at the Glenn Show. Well, Always thank a pleasure you. to talk to you. Thank you. Okay. Take, Take care, care now.